Uh, first, just a housekeeping messages that we have uh, opened a sponsorship option from Patria. So if you're interested to uh, become our patron, just have a look at the patreon.com and then type in web if we talk to search for us and you'll find us there and you can find all the details there. So yeah, so we would like to thank uh, Horiba Scientific, which is our sponsor for this uh, talk today. And um, let's start with our talk. Um, so today is the 22nd June 2021, and it's my pleasure to welcome Associate Professor Jason Howitt. He is the Research Director for the School of Health Sciences at Swinburne University in Australia. So Jason is a neuroscientist who has been working in the extracellular physical field for over a decade. He has invented methods for loading exosomes with specific proteins and also using this technique to show delivery of EVs across the blood brain barrier. He has previously held positions at Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York and Imperial College London and the Flory Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health uh, in Melbourne. So his talk today is about the role of extracellular vesicles in Parkinson's disease. So Thank you for the introduction. And today I'm going to be talking about our work on Parkinson's disease and the role of extracellular vesicles. So this is a project we've been doing for a number of years now. And uh, it started in the lab when we noticed a couple of different interesting proteins could interact. And I'm just going to give you a bit of a background about Parkinson's disease uh, as an introduction. And as you can see here, this man has Parkinson's disease. He has the tremor, he shakes, he can't walk properly, and he freezes. And these are all very uh, um, well-known aspects of Parkinson's disease, but they're not the only ones. Okay, so... Uh, I'll get it sorry. Um, so what is Parkinson's disease? Um, uh, it's, Jason? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's good. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease in the world, and approximately 90% of the cases are idiopathic in nature. And by idiopathic, we basically mean we don't know how they start. And that's really important in the disease, and I, I want to go over that a little bit, because although we know quite a lot about the genetics of Parkinson's disease, it really only makes up about 10% of the known causes of the disease. So about 90% we have unknown origin. And the interesting thing about Parkinson's disease that sets it aside from other neurodegenerative diseases is that its rates are increasing. And I've just taken this, this uh, little snippet of this paper from Lancet Neurology, and it was a very large paper looking at the global health burden of uh, neurological diseases. And you can see the quote there that says, Parkinson's disease was the only neurological disorder with an increasing age standardized rates of death prevalence and dailies between 1990 and 2015. And the reason why that, I think that's very interesting is it's the only neurological disease that's increasing in its rate independent of your age, of the, of the aging population. So as we know, we've had an aging population and things like Alzheimer's disease are increasing throughout the world purely because we actually have an increasing population. Parkinson's disease is a little bit different in that it's increasing independent of that aging population. So it suggests the environmental factors are really starting to play a, a fairly important role in Parkinson's disease itself. And we can see here just a little, uh, some graphs showing that Parkinson's disease is increasing. So genetically, we're not changing, obviously. Uh, humans aren't changing, but Parkinson's disease is increasing compared to other uh, neurological diseases, such, such as multiple sclerosis, which really is staying quite flat, although increasing with our increasing population and also with aging. And you can see that the numbers just keep on increasing for Parkinson's disease. We're sitting at about seven, 7 million people in the world with Parkinson's right now. It's projected to be close to 13 million by 2040. And obviously the burden on society uh, because of these increasing numbers is quite ginormous. So what therapies do we have for Parkinson's disease? Well, basically we don't have very many. We only have ones that have been known for quite a long time. The important thing that we know about Parkinson's disease is that it really does have one gene very closely linked and thought to be causal in the disease process, and that's alpha synuclein. Now, again, this is a little bit different from other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease uh, or ALS, where there's a number of genes that are, are thought to be involved, 
but really there's no direct smoking gun. And for Parkinson's disease, I would argue that alpha-synuclein really is the, the, the largest causal factor, even though there's lots of other genes also implicated in the disease process, it seems that alpha-synuclein is, is the, the number one target. So currently it's still unknown, however, how Parkinson's disease starts in the body. And that's really a fundamental thing that we need to work on if we're gonna start having therapies that can actually treat the disease. Because current treatments only target the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and not the cause. And we always end up having neuronal deaths occurring, even with the therapies that we currently have. Okay, so there's no disease modifying therapies that can reverse, stop, or slow Parkinson's disease progression. Uh, the current treatments that we have have been around for a really long time. And basically, Lenovo Dopa was approved in 1965 by the FDA. So that's the main drug that's used in Parkinson's disease. And that allows, uh, is basically a dopamine, a dopamine uh, mimic. And when it's in the body, it acts like dopamine and allows movement disorders uh, to be prevented, okay? And we also have deep brain stimulation that was approved in the 1990s. This can work for some patients, doesn't work for other patients. And we have other things like cell replacement therapy that also is, is a little bit hit and miss. So we don't have any treatments that actually stop the disease process. We have some treatments that can modify uh, the symptoms. And interestingly, you can see just on the right here, the, the increase in deaths due to Parkinson's disease. And it's obviously increasing. And again, like I said, this suggests that there's environmental factors or risk factors that are actually promoting Parkinson's disease in our society. Now, I want to just quickly point out that here it says the number of deaths due to Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease does not actually kill people. Okay? You die because of uh, related as, Diseases like the diseases with Parkinson's disease, like pneumonia, and also falls. Okay, so Parkinson's disease typically doesn't kill people, but it leads to a, a, a progression of, of, of decline that can subsequently lead to death. So, what are the risk factors for PD? PD? What are the, the environmental factors that, that seem to be contributing to the disease? And if we look directly at the environmental ones, it's things associated with rural living and farm activity. Toxins and pesticides, heavy metals, and solvents. Okay, so they're associated with the disease. Genetically, there's family history of, of PD and then some uh, monogenic causes that can lead to early onset Parkinson's, alpha nucleon is included in this, pink, park, and lark too. Uh, but the number one cause really for, for Parkinson's disease is aging. And I've sort of highlighted that to remind myself because quite often it's forgotten about that. Obviously, aging and age-related decline is associated with Parkinson's disease, like a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. In surprisingly, infectious agents and diseases are also associated with Parkinson's disease. This is much harder to try to um, nail down because if you have an infection in your 40s and you get Parkinson's disease in your late 60s, who's to say that infection actually was, was the cause? So clearly, it's very hard to, to make these associations. But we do have very nice data for HIV patients, and you can see quite a nice association between someone having HIV and the, the odds ratio increasing towards having Parkinson's disease. So it's thought that there is an association between infectious agents and Parkinson's disease itself. And then we have other aspects of risk factors such as head injury, emotional distress, and, and diet. And really, the head injury one is the one that I, I have quite an interest in because uh, it's now shown that there's a close association between head injuries and Parkinson's disease. And it's a pathway that we've studied quite a few times before. So this is a paper that recently came out and I just want to give you the idea about these sort of risk factors. And you can see this, this study uh, showed that family history gives you an odds ratio of 2.19, which is very similar, surprisingly, to head injury, okay, which is at two. So there's an association between uh, genetics and, and Parkinson's disease and these environmental things such as life experience with head injury. I do want to be cautious a little bit when we start looking at these odds ratios because you can see down here, I've already said that pesticides are also a risk factor for PD, but in this paper, it, it seems to be basically an odds ratio of one, which means there's no real association. But the important thing when you look at these sort of papers is where they have taken their sample from. And this is a sample population of people uh, in the UK predominantly around London area, which doesn't really have any rural living or people involved in pesticide exposure. So when they look at the odds ratio for this population, they see that pesticide really isn't linked very closely 
Whereas if we took a, part, a population where there was more farming and exposure to pesticides or heavy metals or things like that, you'd see those odds, odds ratios would increase ginormously. In fact, there's lots of publications showing that. So as always with all these diseases, it's very hard to nail down those environmental factors that are associated with the disease. But I think we now have a fairly good handle on what they are. So what happens with Parkinson's disease and, and how does it actually occur in the body? I said, we don't really know how it starts, but we do actually know what's happening inside the brain during different stages of the disease process. And it's all well, mainly thanks to a, a guy called Henko Black in the Black hypothesis. And basically by using uh, a lot of different um, brains from people who died from Parkinson's disease, he studied the progression of the disease, looking at Lewy bodies, so those aggregates that are formed inside the brain. And in the early stages of Parkinson's disease, so this pre-symptomatic phase, he found that people would have early signs of Parkinson's, so these Lewy bodies in the brain stem, and also this little area over here, the olfactory bulb. Okay. So, and it suggested that the disease process maybe was starting through this area inside the brain. And as he went on to look at brains where people had Parkinson's for, for a longer period, you could see that they seemed to be spreading from the brain stem into the brain and also from the olfactory bulb into the brain. And later in the disease process where people would typically be fully diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, you could see spreading throughout other regions inside the brain. So this was a really important finding. And at the time, I think the field really didn't understand uh, the importance of it and also thought it was probably a little bit out there because it suggested that Parkinson's disease was traveling inside the brain and spreading to different regions. And Brett came up with a hypothesis that essentially that the disease may start from inhaling or actually ingesting something. And it could either go through the olfactory bulb or down to our gut and back up through to the brain via the vagus nerve. And these are the regions where Parkinson's disease, he thought, could start. And this really started to open up the field once people started to uh, understand this a little bit more and start researching it more. And he suggested there was an unknown pathogen that was the trigger for Parkinson's disease. Now, pathogen is just a term that we use to suggest uh, something that we don't know is causing a disease process. And we currently still don't really understand what those pathogens might be, but we also think they're closely associated with those risk factors that I've just, just mentioned. Okay. And importantly, it's, it's, it's really interesting to note that your gut has a very large uh, number of neurons inside of it. And it's thought of being the second brain region of your body, purely because of the nerve, nerve distribution inside the gut. The vagus nerve itself comes back up to the brain and into the brain stem. And people who had uh, vagotomies, which is a, a surgery that actually uh, cuts this the vagus nerve for different reasons, and then we don't actually do that surgery anymore, they can be studied, and it was found that they had a low incidence of Parkinson's disease. So there seems to be this association between the gut and the brain, and it's one of those things that's studied very, very heavily right now. And it also should be pointed out that the earliest signs of Parkinson's disease is a loss of smell and also gut problems, okay? So there's some very good indicators that perhaps Parkinson's disease starts outside of the brain and actually can travel into the brain and once inside the brain, it can transmit to other areas uh, and other cell types within the brain. And that's the sort of area that we're working on right now. So it suggested that there was transmission of perhaps a toxic protein within the body. And I'm going to talk specifically more about the brain here. But, and so there was a thought that alpha-synuclein, which is that protein involved in the bodies, those aggregates inside the brain, was actually trafficking. And the first real hint that this was perhaps true after Hanko Brack showed the Brack hypothesis was experiments looking at host to graft transmission. And what does that mean? Well, it means that in Parkinson's disease, we've known that we can replace cells inside the brain and hopefully uh, treat the disease. And we do the cell replacement using aborted fetuses, their brains. And we take a certain region of the brain that contains the uh, dopaminergic neurons. These are purified and then put into the brains of Parkinson's patients. Okay? I mentioned earlier on that this cell replacement therapy works quite well for some people. It doesn't work very well for others. And there's many people working on this sort of area of research to try and improve Parkinson's disease treatments. The interesting thing here was though, that when they looked at the brains of people who had this uh, transplant, after a certain period of time, so about between six to 10 years, the, the patients actually died and they, they left their brains to research. Researchers started to look at these brains and they found that these early, these new neurons, okay, so effectively they're embryonic neurons that were put inside an adult brain, they also had 
the Lewy bodies that were, were shown inside the brain. Now this meant that these brain, these new neurons, okay, didn't have the required time, they didn't have the aging that we'd normally associate with the disease to actually accumulate uh, problems inside them to lead to the, the aggregates forming inside the brain. And it strongly suggested that there was a pathway from cells outside of these new neurons that were actually pushing uh, misfolded protein into them. And it gave really strong evidence that in fact, the transmission of alpha-synuclein was important in the disease process. Subsequent to that, people started taking uh, Lewy body extracts and putting them into different animals and finding that indeed, that they could transmit the disease. So now there was fairly nice evidence that in fact, the disease was spreading from cell to cell inside the brain. And indeed, people have shown that if you had just take alpha-synuclein itself and you misfold it and then inject it into a mouse, that in fact, it can transmit from cell to cell, <coughs> excuse me, inside the body and actually lead to uh, Parkinson's disease like pathology inside the brain. So the field jumped ginormously in the space of around uh, 10 to 15 years, going from the notion that there was some intrinsic, that there were some problems within a cell that led to the misfolding of alpha nuclein and proteins, to a field that believed that there was actually transmission of the misfolded protein from one cell to the other, which resulted in misfolding and had the disease process that, well, that way. So it was a fairly impressive jump that's occurred in the past uh, decade or two decades. And now we're starting to look and see how can alpha synuclein actually be trapped inside the brain. And there's a number of papers that have come out over the uh, last decade showing that exosomes may be involved in this trafficking of the toxic protein for Parkinson's disease between cells. And so the first paper just showed that alpha synuclein could be involved in uh, put into exosomes. This one showed that if you took alpha nuclein aggregates uh, from the CSF, okay, in exosomes, and put them into cells, that you could actually transmit Lewy bodies. And this paper down here was very interesting because it suggested that the exosomes themselves are the um, area where alpha nuclein can misfold. Okay, so the actual proteins can be put into exosomes, and after it's in exosomes, the actual environment of the exosome causes the misfolding of alpha nuclein. So it caused the pathologic form of the protein to occur. So how could alpha synuclein be trafficked by exosomes uh, to the brain? We really wanted to start looking at uh, how exosomes could actually be involved in in vivo processes. And we, we set this project up about eight or nine years ago now. And the PhD student over here called Uli Sturzenbach uh, started working on how exosomes could actually be trafficked inside an animal. Okay. And the reason why we did this is because at the time I was still a little bit dubious about the role of exosomes in the body, okay, in vivo. I knew that cell culture work uh, really showed very heavily that exosomes could traffic different things, exosome, um, RNA as well as protein, maybe DNA. But we didn't really have at the time a lot of evidence to suggest that exosomes worked in vivo fantastically. So we set up a project where we could actually tag uh, Pre, which is uh, a way of modifying DNA inside the, um, genetically modified mice. And by putting Cre inside exosomes and purifying them, we could deliver them to a specific genetically modified mice that if the exosomes actually trafficked from one cell to the, or, or to the cells in the brain, uh, that the cells would change color. Okay, I don't want to go in, in, into the exact genetic process for how this can occur, but essentially if we gave exosomes that contain this Cre molecule, that when it went inside the brain of a genetically modified mice, any cell that took up that exosome would turn red. And that's what we're showing here. So this is a coronal section of a mouse brain. And if we zoomed in and looked at the red, at the red channel, we could see that there was neurons taking up these exosomes. And this was really powerful evidence to show that indeed exosomes could be taken up by cells, but not only that, they could cross the blood brain barrier and be taken up by a, a lot of different uh, cells inside the brain in different regions suggesting that yes, in vivo exosomes did quite uh, an interesting process in terms of delivering different things uh, and allowing for this cell-to-cell -cell communication to occur. So this sort of uh, gave us a lot of confidence now that exosomes could be involved in different disease processes. And so we want to look much more heavily at how uh, exosomes could be involved in disease and specifically Parkinson's disease. So how could alpha synuclein be loaded into exosomes? And this is you know, the, one of the key points that we really need to find out. 
And what was known at the time when we started looking at this was that the net four ubiquinal ligase could actually ubiquinate alpha synuclein. And the first paper came out in GNES. And then these two papers came back, 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 um, back to back in science. Uh, and they showed that alpha synuclein had a, was uh, regulated by NED4. And NED4 is very interesting to our lab because it's uh, a ubiquinal ligase that we've been working on for a long time. And essentially, uh, in the ubiquination process, okay, so as you mentioned quickly, ubiquination is a way of, mod of tagging a protein generally to send it to different locations inside the cell. And the most famous location that it sends things to, towards is degradation. So ubiquination is known as a degradation type of pathway, but really it's a postcode and it sends things to different areas inside the cell. It works quite simply by uh, allowing for the conjugation of ubiquitin to hit a target protein, which is shown here. Okay. And this involves a complex process and there's different interactions that are required. But this NED41 that's been showing these papers to interact with alpha synuclein, and that would be the target protein here, NED41 allows for the ubiquination of the target protein. And the reason why we had a big interest in this is because another favorite protein of ours called NDFIT1 is also involved in this process. So we really wanted to find out whether NDFIT1 could interact with our target protein, which is alpha synuclein, and allow for this ubiquination to occur. And this would be mediated by NED41. Okay. And we set out to find this, and Mayhem Lo, who's, who's on, on the line here, was actually the scientist who first started doing these experiments with me. And we found that indeed, um, NDFIT1 could do this. But I wanted to actually just quickly talk about what NDFIT1 is and why we had this association. And NDFIT1, we've shown previously, independent of alpha synuclein, to be upregulated in Parkinson's disease. And the reason why we looked at this is because we knew that NDFIT1 had quite an important role in regulating metal transfer inside the brain, in, in specifically in neurons. And so NDFIT can be switched on whenever there's an increase in metals. Okay, so metals we know is one of those risk factors for Parkinson's disease, and in particular iron. And here we can see that in Parkinson's patients, in the substantia nigra, the region of the brain that's affected uh, the most, that NDFIT1 is actually switched on quite heavily compared to control patients. So now we have a gene that, in fact, is uh, switched on in Parkinson's disease, is involved in the regulation of NED4 ligases that we knew were related to alpha synuclein interaction. And it's starting to suggest a pathway that we should look at to see if, in fact, NDFIT plays some sort of role. And I just want to really mention quickly that nothing's new in science. And if we go back to 1924 here, you can see this paper talking about the occurrence of abnormal deposits of iron in the brain in Parkinson's disease. Okay, So it's been known for a very long time that metals are involved in Parkinson's disease. And in fact, it's quite amazing when you read this paper, it references even further back to the 1870s when they first started really talking about the role of uh, iron in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so does NDFF actually play a role in this process? And does it interact with alpha synuclein? And indeed it does. So oh, on the left here, we have uh, um, an immunoprecipitation experiment from the mouse brain. And if we pull down NDFIT1, at the same time, we see co-precipitation of endogenous alpha synuclein in the mouse brain. So it suggests there's an interaction. And we can do this using overexpression studies as well. If we, over, if we express alpha synuclein in all the cells here, and only have the ones where NDFIT is expressed, we can see again, if we do the IP, NDFIT pulls down alpha synuclein, and it also pulls down mutations of alpha synuclein. So the A53T mutation is the best known mutation uh, known about alpha synuclein, which causes misfolding. And NDFIT still interacts with this protein here. So we had very good evidence that NDFIT actually interacts with alpha synuclein. Does that actually change the ubiquitination of alpha synuclein? And indeed it does. So if we just express alpha synuclein with uh, ubiquitin inside the cells, I should go back a second here and explain what these gels are. This, this is a ubiquitination uh, assay, and essentially it looks at how the protein, alpha synuclein, uh, is ubiquitated to put that postcode tag on it. The first uh, little bar up here is if it's monoubiquinated, and then subsequent ubiquitination gets put on, you see there's an increase of about seven kil kilodaltons as it gets polyubiquinated, so multiple ubiquitins get put onto alpha synuclein. The important thing in these plots is that essentially if we express NDFIT1 with uh, NED41 as well as alpha synuclein, we can see a large increase 
in the declination of alpha of alpha nucleon, and predominantly this monoubiquination. Okay, and monoubiquination is important because it's thought to be that trafficking variety of alpha of ubiquitin, as opposed to polyubiquination, which is thought perhaps to be more for degradation. So we now have a protein called NBFIT1 that's upregulated due to risk factors for Parkinson's disease. It interacts with alpha synuclein uh, through NED4 one and ubiquinates it, which is a method for sending alpha, alpha synuclein to different places inside the cell. So where did this interaction occur? We want to look and see how NBFIT actually interacted with alpha synuclein in the cell. And a little while back, we worked on a technique called biomolecular fluorescence complementation. And essentially what you do is you split GFP in half, right, so we call it a YFP uh, in this experiment, and you tag half of one of the proteins you're looking at the interaction, so we call it NBFIT1, and then the other protein, alpha synuclein, with the two halves. And if these two proteins interact together, you can see this fluorescence occurring inside the cell. So it's a very nice technique for looking at where different proteins are uh, interacting inside the cell. And when you combine that with different uh, markers, so endosomal markers in this case, you can start to see where the interaction is occurring inside the cell. And we can see here, so blue here is the nucleus of the cell. Red on these cells is uh, different markers for endosomes. So RAB5 is an early endosomal marker. RAB7 is a late endosome marker, as well as RAB9. And RAB11 is a marker for uh, recycling endosomes. And essentially, you can see very easily in the quantification here that, in fact, NBFIP and alpha synuclein interact very closely on RAB5 and RAB11 contain endosomes, uh, which is very nice evidence to suggest that they are occurring in this early endosomal process. Okay, so RAB5 early endosomal process where alpha synuclein and NBFIP are interacting, and also in this recycling and this pathway, which results in exosomal transmission. So we now have. NBFIP interacting with alpha synuclein and involved in ubiquination and then trafficking on endosomes inside the cell that leads to a pathway that we know is involved in exosomal secretion. So NBFIP is well known actually, in fact, to package different proteins in exosomes. And this has started from our lab uh, that we've shown different proteins can also be packaged in exosomes. This is for NED4 ubiquitin ligases and major tumor suppressor PCAM. And also that paper I was talking about how we can actually modify uh, exosomes for, for transmission inside the brain. So this suggested quite strongly that perhaps NBFIP's interaction with alpha synuclein was resulting in the loading of the protein inside of exosomes. And to do to look at this more closely, we expressed alpha synuclein. Uh, this is just in HEC 293 cells, as well as NBFIP, uh, the two varieties of alpha synuclein, and we looked to see if we could. Uh, push alpha synuclein into exosomes. We did this using ultracentrifugation, our purification of exosomes, and we could see that indeed, only when NBFIP1 is expressed do we see alpha synuclein going into the exosomes. So if there's no NBFIP, essentially alpha synuclein does not go into exosomes, and the quantification is over here. I'm using the term exosomes here and not extracellular vesicles because we do believe that this process is going through that early to recycling endosomal process which is that pathway that leads to um, an exosome being formed inside the cell, rather than just extracellular vesicles, which can come from the budding from the cell surface, as well as that endosomal process. So we now knew that alpha synuclein could be uh, loaded into exosomes, can actually transmit between cells. And we did this in vivo, uh, in vitro, sorry. And so we had our donor cells, and we could overexpress alpha synuclein in BFIP1, we can purify our exosomes and put them on recipient cells. And what did we see? Indeed, it was only when we overexpressed NBFIP1 that we could see recipient cells uptaking these exosomes that contain alpha synuclein. So we knew that there was transmission now occurring uh, from or was possible from one cell type to the other that was mediated by NBFIP1. So that's all good and well, but that's overexpression. And overexpression. Uh, studies are prone to a lot of problems because obviously you are disrupting the cell in many ways by causing this large overexpression of different proteins. So we also wanted to see if we could look at the transmission of alpha synuclein or sorry, the loading of alpha synuclein into exosomes uh, using an endogenous pathway. Okay, so here we're using cells that actually express alpha synuclein endogenously, so they're native uh, level 
And what we've done is we've called stress to these cells by putting iron on them. Now we know that when we put iron on cells, okay, that metal, that it upregulates NGF1. You can see here increasing concentrations of iron uh, increase the levels of NGF1 inside the cell. We know that NDF interacts with alpha synuclein, and in doing so, it can uh, load alpha synuclein into exosomes. And indeed, that's what we see here. So increasing concentrations of iron when we purify the exosome from these cells, we see an increasing amount of alpha synuclein. Okay, now I should mention alpha synuclein in this block is then code for uh, phosphor alpha synuclein, which picks up the different aggregates of alpha synuclein inside the cell or inside the exosome here. And we can see the monomer here of alpha synuclein and these subsequent bands. I should highlight that this is THG101, not alpha synuclein. And this is a, a loading control to show that we have roughly the same amount of exosomes here. We see a large aggregate occurring at about 75 kilodalton, and then these increasing aggregates of alpha synuclein. This large aggregate represents uh, a, a, um, a four copies of alpha synuclein accumulating essentially inside the exosome. And then these much larger varieties here are probably the, the totally misfolded alpha synuclein occurring inside of exosomes. So it's important to note here, this is the endogenous levels of alpha synuclein. There's no overexpression. This is just what was inside the cell itself. We can look to see to, to make sure that we have uh, something in the size range of exosomes. And indeed, these come out to be about 145 nanometers when we're using MGA analysis. And it's not only this type of uh, iron that can actually upregulate and lead to this pathway. We've also used chloroquine, which is a method of uh, inhibiting um, lysosomal degradation, which starts to push or traffic the proteins to different areas. And we can see that NDFIP is upregulated at the same time with the increasing amount of chloroquine. And at the same time, we see that in the exosomes, alpha synuclein now is being pushed into the exosome. Again, we have the monomer here and then the different aggregates. So we're showing that two types of risk factors for Parkinson's disease can actually result in the loading of alpha synuclein into exosomes. And it appears that once in exosomes, that these alpha synuclein is misfolding. Okay. We have to do a little bit further work to, to try and determine whether alpha synuclein is misfolded before it's gone into the exosome or if it's misfolded once it's inside the exosome. But we heavily believe that right now it's after an alpha synuclein being trapped into the exosome that it leads to the misfolding of alpha synuclein. Okay, so. This leads us to our model that we have for uh, the trafficking of alpha synuclein into exosomes. And essentially what we think is happening that there's some stress inside the cell. This leads to upregulation of alpha of ND fit one. ND fit one can recruit alpha synuclein. Okay, this is all happening on the early endosome, around five marker uh, early endosome. Ned41 comes in and allows for the ubiquination of alpha synuclein. This ubiquination is a signal that mono ubiquination in particular for transport to the S-door complex in multi-particular bodies. From here, alpha synuclein is loaded into uh, the, the vesicles, which allows then for the traffic into the cell surface and the subsequent release of an exosome. So that's the, the pathway in the model that we think we're working with. Okay. So just a little quick overview, NDFIP is a stress response protein that is upregulated by risk factors for TB. NDFIP can load alpha synuclein into exosomes and exosomes can transmit alpha synuclein from cell to cell. But we don't know if this is occurring in vivo for alpha synuclein, but we had that evidence before using our free recombinase experiments to suggest that exosomes can transmit things inside the brain. So we really want to ask, can exosomes really transmit alpha synuclein in the body and started doing some in vivo experiments. Importantly, all these experiments that I'm going to show you are using the endogenous alpha synuclein. So we're not overexpressing alpha synuclein, we're not misfolding it, we're not heating it up, we're not trying to do anything like preform fibril. We're using cells and we're stressing them, okay, with these risk factors for Parkinson's disease, such as iron. Uh, we're purifying the exosomes and then we're nasally delivering to mice. And we deliver them to two different types of mice. There's the wild type mice and normal mice, and also what's known as A53T mice or M83 mice. And these are mice that are genetically modified to overexpress alpha synuclein. And they're used in neurodegenerative studies quite often because we want to accelerate the disease process. To the state, say, right from the out, out front, mice do not get Parkinson's disease. Okay, we're using them as a model of Parkinson's disease. And typically in the field, quite often the A53T mice are used to accelerate the process. 
So when we set out these experiments, we thought we we're going to need to use these mice to perhaps uh, assist in seeing anything like Parkinson's disease. We waited for the mice to be about two months of age, so essentially adults before we started these experiments. And we gave weekly doses of, of, of exosomes containing alpha synuclein. Okay? And we did this for a period of four months. We did behavioral testing on the mice throughout each month uh, to, to see if there was any natural changes that, that we could observe with the mice. And the nasal delivery, I think I want to go over a little bit more closely because I think it's a very important component here. And the reason why I say this is because if you look up nasal delivery online or in papers, you quite often see an image like this, where you can give uh, the nasal delivery to the mice and essentially you, you wouldn't give this amount of volume, this is a very large volume as you get here. You can only give about, about two microliters per, per uh, dose to a mouse. You can hold the mice and essentially you, you release one drop and as the mice breathes in, it, it kind of vaporizes it and the motion is that's being delivered to the animal. Now, looking at this image here, this is definitely not how we actually delivered our nasal delivery. And the reason why is because the mouse is sitting in a fairly upright position. When you do this with a mouse, uh, you will find that if you have it an upright position, nearly everything you deliver will just go straight down into the stomach and all the lungs, essentially. So you're not really delivering anything that goes into the pathway, perhaps through that olfactory bulb, which is essentially what you're trying to do with nasal delivery. So it's quite important actually to hold the mouse almost uh, on a horizontal plane. And then when you do the nasal delivery, you have a much better chance of the actual delivery occurring uh, or going towards a pathway that's more delivered towards that um, uh, uh, <laughs> nasal route as opposed to the oral route or the, the lungs. Uh, and you have delivery to the brain that, that really uh, can occur much better. So that's just a little bit of a, a side note to, to say how we've actually done this model and the delivery using nasal delivery. And when we did that, we found that uh, for the A53T mice that were delivered exosomes containing alpha synuclein. So I'm going to use the terminology control exosomes and control exosomes are cells that weren't treated with the stress. Okay, they were exactly the same cells. They were purified the exact same way. So essentially they have exosomes being delivered they just haven't undergone that cell stress. Okay, these are control exosomes. Alpha synuclein exosomes are the ones that have undergone cell stress, the, the metal. Okay, so ions being delivered to these cells, and then they've been purified and given to the animal. Okay, and one of the things that we noticed at around the four month time period was animals that have been given the alpha synuclein containing exosomes started to show high, high limb clasping. Okay, so they, they withdraw their limbs, their hind limbs when you hold them up. A normal mouse will always spray their legs when you hold them up like this. And it's suggestive that there is some sort of neurodegeneration that's occurring inside the animal. It's certainly not 100% correct, and you can get mice that do this that have no, no fault at all. But it is a very good indicator as you go along your cohort to mice that maybe there are some changes occurring. And then as we went along the, the process, we could see uh, different behavioral tests. And in particular, we like to use this poll test. And it's a very simple animal test, behavioral test. And I like it because essentially there's no ambigu ambiguity in this test. And by that, I mean, if you put a mouse on a pole uh, and you face it vertically, it will always want to turn around and climb down. <clears throat> now, Parkinson's disease is best, best known as a movement disorder. And so this is a very uh, complex motor task that's occurring for this mouse to do this technique. In particular, you need grip strength, okay, with all the limbs, uh, but you also need that hind limb coordination to actually turn on the pole. I'll show you this again. The front paws is reasonably easy, but here right now, see that little hind limb? It has to turn around on the pole. It's quite a complex motor task to do. Okay, All mice do this on a pole. It's a very nice test. When we've done the control exosomes, the mice can complete this test at 100%, no problem. When we look at mice that have been delivered alpha synuclein exosomes, you can see this guy has some grip strength, would like to turn around the pole, but really is struggling with the motor coordination. As you can see, trying to bring this left hind limb around to be able to turn, it actually can't do it. I'm gonna stop the video here. The mice actually falls off uh, because it loses grip strength as well. So this mouse has lost motor coordination now and cannot turn on the pole. This is an excellent test and very reproducible test and doesn't involve any ambiguity in, in the way that we do it. Uh, and when we look to see the um, quantification here, we can see that all the wild-type mice given control exosomes contain on the pole. 
MAD3 mice, so these are those A53T, so the, the genetically modified mice, they can pretty much all turn on the pole and no problem. And then we've given the mice uh, exosomes that have been spiked with iron. Okay, so they're still controlled exosomes, but the control factor levels of iron, we've spiked them with iron. And again, these mice still can turn on the pole with no problems. A score of two indicates that they cannot turn on the pole, a score of one indicates they actually fall off the pole. Animals that have been given exosomes containing alpha nucleon clearly showed a difference. And this is a wild type mouse given exosomes uh, containing alpha nucleon. They failed a number of times in the poll. And then these M83 uh, T mice, M83 mice uh, really failed 100%. Okay, so these mice already have a lot of alpha nucleon in them. And clearly, uh, the behavioral phenotype here is very strong, but they cannot completely fix. So now with the motor coordination is gone. Very importantly, though, if we give the exact same exosomes to mice that are knocked out by alpha nucleon gene, so that's SNCA, nothing happens. Okay. So this strongly suggests that alpha nucleon is required to be inside the brain to allow for this transmission to occur, this exosomal transmission of alpha nucleon cell to cell. Okay. And that's very important inside the field. So the delivery also of alpha nucleon exosomes to wild type mice also shows strong uh, motor phenotypes in a really simple test. So the poll test I mentioned was quite a hard motor function test. A poll test is very simple for a mouse and essentially it's just walking along a pole and you can see all mice can do this 100%. If you've given the mouse these alpha nucleon containing exosomes, you can see now this same mouse after a month starts to have a number of foot faults okay, and slides off the bed. You can see the hindlimbs in particular fall off, the mouse freezes on the pole. Okay. So importantly, it's showing that even on, on an easy motor function test that there's disease progression. So the pole test, we can see quite early that the disease is happening. And you can see that we can accelerate the disease process by having these A53T mice, these overexpressed alpha nucleon mice. Essentially by four months of age, they already show very strong motor impairments. The wild type mice, it takes longer for the disease progression to occur. Okay, so it suggests that uh, there's a requirement for alpha nucleon to be there, and the levels of alpha nucleon are important for how quickly the disease process occurs inside these mice. So we can see again that if you just give control exosomes, all these mice can walk on the pole very simple. Okay, it's an, an easy test for mice. If you're given the alpha nucleon containing exosomes, the wild type mice, importantly, had a number of faults on type on, on the beam, and indeed the transgenic mice all failed fairly heavily on type of beam. Again, if we give these alpha nucleon containing exosomes to alpha nucleon knockout mice, nothing happens. Okay. So it suggests that exosomes being delivered can cause behavioral phenotypes, and importantly, there's a disease progression over time that can be accelerated if we have extra alpha nucleon present or can be prevented if there is no oxygen nucleon present inside the animal. Now, this suggests that in fact, exosomes are involved in pathology of oxygen nucleon, and we're showing motor impairments that are related very closely to Parkinson's disease. Again, if this is a mouse, mice don't get Parkinson's. So <clears throat> we also want to look a little bit more heavily about the, the gait analysis of these mice, and you can do that using what's called digigate analysis. And essentially these mice are, are, are trained to walk on a treadmill. And as they walk along, there's a camera underneath and it can image how the mice walks. And we can see again, the alpha nucleon delivered exosomes lead to problems in, in terms of running, as well as changing the actual uh, step movements of the mice. And you can see here that the wild type and, and M83 mice are all, all happening there. Importantly, not everything is, is ruined in the mice, okay? Their stride length is the same, their stance width is the same, they eat, they develop normally, okay? So it's fairly specific in terms of the pathology that we're seeing. And does this actually lead to pathology inside the brain? So we have those behavioral phenotypes. And indeed, when we look inside the brains of these mice, we can see the aggregates of alpha nucleon in green here, and blue likewise with ubiquitin. And we can see this in the motor cortex of the brain, as well as a number of other regions. And we can use confirmation or specific antibodies that also show this aggregation process inside the brain. Importantly, we can also see that in the substantia nigra, the major region that is known to be involved in Parkinson's disease, that there is also some degeneration occurring in the dopaminergic neurons uh, that release um, 
So that means we can bulk and movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. So we have both the behavioral phenotypes as well as the brain pathology, suggesting that we have something very similar to what is occurring in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so just a summary overall. Risk factors are for PD can upregulate NG tip one, which results in the loading of alpha-synuclein into exosomes. Exosomes containing alpha-synuclein can transmit the misfold of proteins to other cells. And nasal delivery of exosomes containing alpha-synuclein results in motor impairments and PD-like pathology in the brains of mice. So previously, we don't really know how Parkinson's disease has started inside the body. We're suggesting that risk factors for Parkinson's disease can upregulate this pathway. There's a donor cell that it uh, undergo stress, resulting in the exosomal loading of alpha-synuclein that can then be transported to recipient cells inside the body. This occurs most likely throughout the process over time and can increase depending on the actual uh, risk factors that are involved in, in, in the, the person or here in the mouse. We show that it's in uh, PD-like pathology and also um, behavioral phenotypes. So what does this mean for Parkinson's disease therapy? And I want to get back to this because obviously I started with the disease and how we have very little treatments. This is from the Michael J. Fox website and it's showing the, the number of different clinical trials that are undergoing uh, testing right now. And of these, you can see that a number of them are involved looking at antibodies towards uh, alpha-synuclein to prevent the disease spread. And I wanted to quickly show our data here that shows that in fact the alpha-synuclein that we know is, is uh, exosomal related is in fact inside the exosome. So it's not actually on the surface. And we did that by showing uh, this is the input, the case of alpha-synuclein and it's exosomes. If we use proteinase K treatment on, site, on the exosomes, alpha-synuclein does not get degraded. Okay, But if we use a detergent, try X100, which actually opens up the uh, exosomes itself, we can see that proteinase K can get inside and degrade alpha-synuclein. So that's quite strong evidence to, to suggest that alpha-synuclein is in fact internalized by our exosomes. And when we look at these studies, we can see that there's three phase trials going uh, underway right now, looking at antibodies to prevent the spread of alpha-synuclein and this whole of alpha-synuclein. I'm very unsure if these antibodies are actually going to have an effect if in fact the pathological form of alpha-synuclein is inside an exosome, because it's not going to be possible for uh, the antibodies to actually target them. These two studies here are looking at ways of preventing the aggregation of alpha-synuclein, and there's potential that they may be able to stop the aggregation of alpha-synuclein uh, in exosomes. So what I'm trying to say here is that perhaps there's you know, a bit of a problem in some of the Parkinson's disease drug trials, and uh, Anybody in Europe's generation will know that the Alzheimer's uh, drug has just been released uh, or approved by the FDA, and there's some similar concerns around there. So in Europe's generation, are we there yet? Are exosomes involved in these processes? I think would be an important aspect for us to look at further. Um, okay, so I'd just like to acknowledge the people who did a lot of this work. Alex Masuski is a PhD student, Ulrich also, Michelle's been a long-term RA, uh, and close collaborators that I've been working with for a number of years shown here and of course the animal staff and thank you all for listening thank you very much jason it's a wonderful talk this uh, very interesting study there using the mouse um, and how they behave so distinctly different and it's amazing that it's like it's, it's very very quick don't you think like in two months they start to behaving that way yeah, so it takes around two months for the um, uh, transgenic mouse and about six months for the, or four months for the wild type mouse. It's all dependent on the delivery that we give. So we could deliver just one dose of the exosomes and essentially the disease progress would be much, much longer. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to work within a time frame, and the, and the reason why we work within a time frame is the M83, so the transgenic mouse, after about 10 months of age, they start showing phenotypes themselves. So we wanted this study to look only at six months to make sure we didn't confound the experiments um, with that, with the transgenic mouse. We weren't expecting the wild type mouse actually to develop a phenotype. That was actually a control. Uh, and it looks like you know, the pathology is, is much stronger than we thought it would be with the exosomes. So they seem to be um, 
much better than we thought they would be when we started the study. So now we're going back and doing longer term studies with the wild type mice, delivering much less and waiting uh, those time periods to see if the disease progresses, which is what we're looking at. Mm, I think I think it's, it's very convincing if the wild type also shows that. It's very, very good one. Um, how about the immunohistochemistry? Did, did, you, did you see any sort of um, severe, um, I don't know, uh, what happens in the brain, whether there have swollen inflammation or whatnot? Uh, we haven't looked at inflammation and that's certainly something that we mm -hmm. need to look at more. We've seen cell death, so I don't show the data here, but uh, certainly in some regions of the brain, there's cell death occurring and that's only late in the disease, in our mouse model of disease. Okay. Uh, so we definitely see, see that there's some cell death occurring. Definitely there's dopaminergic cell loss and those aggregates look very similar to what are Lewy bodies. We don't term them as Lewy bodies because Lewy bodies is what occurs in humans and we're looking at mouse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering whether Ochia Sensei would like to comment. Um, Uh, there's a there's a comment here from Ochia Sensei. Just go ahead, Ochia Sensei. Oh, okay. So, oh, that's very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel I'm not the expert in this field, but I I hear your talk. So yeah, the alpha synuclein uh, aggregates like our carrying AB like uh, prion uh, like behavior. So uh, it's so interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, I should just quickly mention. Um, it is prion-like, which is exactly what you just said. It's not prion. So we're not showing transmission between people or between mm. animals here. Um, and I really want to make sure that I say that because uh, I don't want people thinking they can catch Parkinson's disease. Mm. That's, that's not what we're trying to show. We're suggesting a pathway of transmission with inside the body. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Ochi Sensei. Um... Hi, Jason. This is Leigh here. Can I, can I share something? Uh, I think yes. it's a wonderful talk. You haven't aged any, any at all since I, we last met. <laughs> right. So, uh, okay. Uh, we, we always think that the anti fib right, is always a good guy. Uh, but from, from this talk, I, I have a shift of a paradigm. Maybe anti fib is the catalyst for all these things to, to start, right? W would you have any uh, data to show that, let's say, M83 mice, then we uh, put in the anti fib one exosomes to see whether it triggers the uh, alpha synuclein to aggregate even faster than their normal onset. And perhaps an experiment that uh, can be designed is, say uh, we use uh, alpha synuclein with anti-fib overexpression exosomes or, or even endogenous exosomes, and then put it into either anti-fib uh, knockout mice or anti-fib overexpression mice. So, so that's some, some of my, my thought when I was listening because we, we, we wanted want so hard to, to think that MD5 is a good guy. Maybe he's a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so there, there are experiments that we'd like to do. It's a little bit hard to cross the mice uh, and, and they're very big experiments to, to cross the overexpressed MD5 and the uh, knockout MD5 mouse with the transgenic mice uh, and then wait. So we actually haven't done those experiments yet. Now you're talking about, so previously ND5 we've shown is involved in neuroprotection. And that's why Lee is saying that uh, we think ND5 is a good guy. And because generally speaking, when we see it overexpressed, uh, cells survive. And in fact, that's what we do see in Parkinson's disease. And that's one of the interesting things. So it looks like that, um, say a neuron gets cell stress and say dying, uh, it upregulates ND5-1, which results in this cascade of you know, getting rid of a potential protein that could be toxic to that cell. So when it does that, it actually is still doing a good thing for that neuron. So that neuron can survive now. However, subsequently, and especially if um, uh, pathways outside of the cell for removal of toxic things are not working very well, it allows for the transmission of that exosome or EB to another cell. So it's acting like the good guy. So MD5 is acting like the good guy to the original cell that's undergoing stress. Unfortunately, it has the potential then to allow transmission to other cells if you don't have good um, 
I guess, waste disposal systems inside the body. And that's one of the things that we'd like to look at a lot more to determine whether that you know, plays a role. And a lot of the genes that are involved in Parkinson's disease are known to be involved in those endosomal processes. And also we, we know that you know, um, sleep and loss of sleep are really important things in the disease trajectory. So I believe that there's certainly a number of ways that, um, you know, even though Indifit might be a good guy to one cell, it's not good for the overall at those times of stress. Yeah, thank you so much. But I, I really feel like this is really a um, very, very beautiful study. Thank you for carrying on for, for, for <laughs> such a long time. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think I've got uh, probably one last question. So less, less of the disease, but more of the molecular processing. So um, how's this alpha synuclein? Is it always being secreted? Or mm. what, what is the actual normal function if, yeah. it, if they're not misfolded? Can you explain a bit? Yeah, so alpha synuclein is quite a, a, an enigma. Um, it's one of the proteins that's expressed most heavily inside the brain. And we still don't know exactly what alpha synuclein does in terms of its function. It's thought to be involved in uh, um, transmission of uh, the synapse, okay? But you can have alpha synuclein knockout mice and they really don't have a very big phenotype. Now, um, alpha synuclein is released from cells outside of EVs and that's been well known for a long time. And it's one of the reasons why uh, people start to think about antibody therapy, okay? And I should mention that the amount of alpha synuclein release in exosomes is very small compared to the overall release of alpha synuclein in the cell. And it's probably only about 5% of the actual alpha synuclein that's released is ever inside an exosome. That's under normal conditions though. Okay, so I'm talking, the talk today was about a process that gets upregulated. So at different times, exosomes may release significantly more alpha synuclein in exosomes than just the, the normal, trans, uh, normal release of the pre alpha synuclein, I'll, I'll call it. Um, the interesting thing about Parkinson's disease though is that in fact, people with TB have a lower amount of that pre alpha synuclein inside their CSF, uh, indeed inside their blood as well. So the antibody therapy, I don't think is going to do a whole lot. Uh, and I think if you look to Alzheimer's disease, you can see that they've targeted A beta a number of times and they can show definitely they can decrease A beta. It's never worked in clinical trials. I suspect we may have something similar here. So even though a lot of alpha synuclein does get released by cells in the body, I think it's really that toxic form that's the most important thing. And I think that exosomes pro provide an environment that leads to that toxicity. So the leading, loading of that alpha synuclein into exosomes is one of those critical factors. So do you also find the native alpha synuclein in exosomes ever? Yeah, so we do see the monomer there. Uh, the, study, the, the blocks that I'm showing are all endogenous and we are right at the detection limit to actually see alpha synuclein all using Western blood. Um, we could go to things like ELISAs, but then we're not showing that they're inside the exosome. So we, we're using the Western blocks for that. We do see a little bit of monomer, but the majority form that we see is those misfolded, those aggregated forms inside the exosomes. So yeah, yeah. and uh, there's two papers now outside of our work that suggests that the exosomes actually um, have a lipid environment that can cause alpha synuclein to misfold. Mm. Wow. Okay, thank you so much. That was a very interesting study and you delivered the story from the beginning until the end. It uh, makes me learn so much about Parkinson's disease. <laughs> thanks so much for sharing that with us. Excellent, thank you for having us. And thanks for putting on such a wonderful uh, you know, service to the ED community. Uh, thank you, Jason.